Dazed Italy bickers as it seeks answers for coronavirus spread. Stunned by Europe's biggest surge of the coronavirus, Italy appears to be operating in near panic mode. The government imposed a lockdown on an area of 50,000 people near Milan, authorities cancelled the remaining days of the Venice Carnival, and several universities closed. Across Italy, Chinese restaurants were shunned. The Chinatown area in Prato near Florence saw many small businesses close as Chinese nationals voluntarily remained at home for two-week periods. Matteo Salvini, leader of the League Party, used the outbreak to attack Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte for not defending the borders. He cited the docking of the Ocean Viking humanitarian ship in a Sicilian port with 274 African migrants on board to say Italy needs to make our borders armor-plated. He called on Conti to resign if he isn't able to defend Italy and Italians. The rise in infections to more than 130 from just a handful a week ago has come at a bad moment for Conti's administration, already under fire for failing to mount a coherent response to the spread of the virus. As Conti chairs a series of marathon meetings in Rome to counter the spread of the disease, his plan for tax reforms and investments to restart an ailing economy has stalled, and now businesses are set to be affected by measures against the virus. Conti's government was censured by Beijing for an early ban on all flights to and from China, a decision criticized by Walter Ricciardi, a member of the World Health Organization's Executive Council, because it stopped authorities from tracing arrivals as travelers could use stopovers to reach Italy. Efforts to contain the coronavirus could have been initially thwarted by difficulty in identifying the roots of the spread. Almost all of Italy's cases are linked to a 38-year-old man who sought treatment at a hospital in the Lombardy region on February 18. While at the hospital, he infected dozens of patients and medical staff, who then spread it further afield. Tracking efforts initially focuses on a friend of the man, a businessman who had returned from China, but tests proved negative and the origin of the contagion remains a mystery. Conti is on difficult ground, he's got to find an explanation for the big spread of the virus, said Sofia Ventura, a political science professor at Bologna University, which announced its closing Monday along with other universities and schools in the northern Emilia-Romagna region. Conti hasn't ruled out suspending the Schengen Agreement that allows free movement between the borders of European Union members. To guarantee maximum protection, the government would take any measure to safeguard the health of citizens, he told reporters on the sidelines of the EU summit in Brussels on Friday. The League called for a suspension of Schengen. Salvini's political calculation is clear. While his league is the country's most popular party, he was interior minister in Conti's first coalition when his effort last year to force fresh elections backfired. He now has to contend with the resurgence of the right-wing Brothers of Italy party, which has leapfrogged ex-premier Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia. Borders are the perfect tissue for Salvini, and he's out for revenge, with his ally and rival Giorgia Meloni of the Brothers of Italy party rising in opinion polls, said Ventura of Bologna University. In his Facebook video, Salvini zeroed in on African migrants like the ones who landed in Sicily, saying God forbid one of them turned out to be a virus carrier. At the port of Pozzallo, the latest migrants to attempt the deadly journey from North Africa were placed in isolation on Sunday, while the crew were confined to the ship. None of the cases in Italy so far have been linked to African migrants. Health authorities still don't know the origin of the disease's spread, according to Emergency Commissioner Angelo Borelli. It's difficult to express forecasts for the spread, he said. The only concrete and valid measure to be taken is therefore the one of closing off territories. Conti himself was left acknowledging that he hadn't expected the surge. I was surprised by this explosion of cases, which had been kept under control until a short time ago, he told RAI Television Sunday. But he insisted, the line of maximum precaution has paid off, even though it doesn't appear so. Joey Logano overcomes missed pit call to win at Las Vegas. The adjustments to a major off-season overhaul at Team Penske continued Sunday at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, where miscommunication between Joey Logano and his new crew chief led to a botched final pit stop. Logano still wound up in victory lane for the second year in a row, winning a two-lap sprint to the finish that ended under caution. A caution with six laps remaining forced teams to make strategic decisions and crew chief Paul Wolf told Logano to come to pit road for new tires. Logano didn't hear Wolf and remained on track, a move that cycled him into the lead but put him in position to hold off a slew of contenders on fresh tires. Logano knew it was critical to get his Ford separated from the pack quickly on the restart to have any shot at the win. Clean air was going to be key with old tires, he said. If I got swallowed up by a couple cars, I was just going to fall backwards really quick. 
Logano got a push from Ricky Stenhouse Jr. on the restart with two laps remaining, then threw a block on William Byron to maintain his position out front that Logano called the winning move. I was able to get down in front of him and then be able to separate myself a little bit from the field, he said. Logano, the 2018 champion, just missed advancing to the championship race last season. At the start of this year, owner Roger Penske announced he'd swap the crews of Logano, Ryan Blaney, and Brad Keselowski, with Logano getting Wolf, the crew chief who led Keselowski to a cup title. They've worked together at the track the last three weeks and Logano praised the new pairing. He's done such a great job, and it's been fun getting to know each other, and the whole team, Logano said. The pit crew was amazing today. I think we gained a spot every time at least. Proud of the effort that everyone has put in over the offseason. Logano had taken the white flag when a crash occurred deep in traffic to bring out the caution, freeze the field and secure the victory for the number 22 Ford. The 24th victory of Logano's career broke a tie with Ricky Rudd for 35th on NASCAR's all-time win list. Matt Benedetto in a Ford for the Wood Brothers, a Penske partner for his second race was 0.491 seconds behind to tie his career best finish. This is all just too surreal, he said. Tough to be that close, but, hey, this is only the second race of the season. So it was the strength of this team. It's so cool to have the backing of all the people that allow me to drive this thing. Stenhouse, pole sitter for the Daytona 500 a week ago, was third in a Chevrolet in his second race for new team JTG Diarty Racing. So far so good, Stenhouse said. Two weeks, we've been fast this week, we weren't bad this week, and we know what we need to work on. Austin Dillon was fourth for Richard Childress Racing and followed by Jimmy Johnson, Bubba Wallace, Logano teammate Keselowski and Kevin Harvick. Kyle Larson and Ty Dillon rounded out the top 10. Daytona 500 winner Denny Hamlin was the highest finishing Toyota driver in 17th as the brand and Joe Gibbs Racing struggled the entire 400 miles. Ross Chastain drove the number 6 Ford for Roush Fenway Racing as the replacement driver for Ryan Newman, who suffered a head injury in a crash on the final lap of Monday night's Daytona 500. It ended a streak of 649 consecutive starts dating to 2002 for Newman, who has no timetable for a return but his team said Sunday that he intends to get back in his car. Chastain finished 29th, in part because of a late spin, but ran inside the top 10 earlier in the race. Roush Fenway has not indicated who will drive the car next week. Chastain was bitterly disappointed as he headed to his Xfinity Series car for the resumption of Saturday's race, which was rained out after 50 laps and rescheduled for after the main event. I was just overdriving there at the end for sure. It just got away from me there and got loose, Chastain said. The car deserved a lot better finish. I just didn't have great restarts. These guys kind of ate me alive on the restarts and I'd lose three or four spots every time and picked the wrong lines through one and two, and then three and four again I just kept making silly mistakes that I should learn from after I make the mistake once. I just have to be better. This was the best moment of Fury v Wilder and it wasn't even part of the fight. On Saturday night, Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder clashed for the WBC Heavyweight World Boxing Champion in front of a rapturous crowd in Las Vegas. After seven rounds it was the outspoken, charismatic, and sometimes controversial British boxer who came out on top after a stoppage following several heavy hits which had forced Wilder to the floor. This is the second time Fury has scaled the mountain of heavyweight boxing but this victory felt even more significant after he overcame a bout of depression and weight gain. That being said, Fury hasn't shown any lack of confidence in the build-up to the fight and just hours before the showdown appeared to be his usual, comedic self, taking an opportunity to mock Wilder during their respective warm UPS. As the Fox Sports cameras cut to the backstage area to see how the two men were preparing for the contest, the contrast between the pair couldn't have been much bigger. While, 34-year-old Wilder, looked serious and focused, limbering himself up on the floor, 31-year-old Fury was laughing and joking around, wearing a crown and pretending to spank Wilder when he noticed his opponent on the split screen. Fury's complete lack of nerves, or abundance of, depends which way you want to interpret this clip, resonated with those on Twitter who couldn't help but find his antics hilarious. Here is another clip of Fury, dancing around in his pants listening to James Brown. Once again, this is before a major championship match, which he went on to win. Seven wounded in shooting at flea market outside Houston, Texas. A gunman opened fire at a Houston, Texas area flea market on Sunday, wounding seven people, and a suspect was taken into custody at the scene, the sheriff said. No one is critically wounded, Harris County Sheriff Ed Gonzalez said on Twitter, 
adding that the victims were being taken to hospital. Some injuries may have been a result of a bullet ricochet. A male is detained at the scene, Gonzalez said. Local media reported that emergency calls about the shooting came in at around 7.41 p.m. local time from an unincorporated area of Harris County north of Houston proper. The new British passports will be made in Poland and the jokes are writing themselves. Just when we thought we were done with the many ironies of Brexit, another whopper comes along and stops us in our tracks. If you voted for Brexit you'll probably be looking forward to receiving a brand spanking new blue passport, void of the burgundy red of the old EU passport. However, you might be dismayed to learn that these new passports won't be made in Britain at all. In fact, they are coming straight from Poland. In a report published on Saturday by The Times, it has been revealed that the passports will be made in a factory in Ksu, Poland via Franco-slash-Dutch company thanks to EU procurement rules. This was after the British company who were competing for the contract, Delaru, lost out on the £260 million 11-year contract which was handed to the French multinational group Thales. The passports will begin to be distributed in March, 2020, but the irony of them coming from Europe, an institution that the UK has just voluntarily left did not escape many.